In this video, I'm gonna talk about why does concrete pumping cause air to go away and then why does the air come back? My name is Tyler Lay, I'm a concrete maniac and I wanna help you make the best concrete you possibly can. I'm a professor at Oklahoma State University and I was invited to give a talk at the National Concrete Consortium with 40 different state DOTs showed up to help talk all about concrete. And I got to talk about this subject, so I wanted to share you the presentation in its entirety. It's a little bit long, but it was fun. It was cool and it made a lot of people think and some people change their mind. And so I'll tell you what, you can help. If you like this video, make sure you share it. Make sure you discuss it with people around you and make sure you comment below. I have some questions coming up at the end that I really wanna make sure that I get your answers to. Also, I will put different chapters or different time breaks in the video so you can see when all the awesomeness comes. You can fast forward to whatever is important to you. Let's start this party. So concrete pumping, why do you lose air volume and why does the air come back? I have a whole host of different people at the bottom of the page here, amazing students that help make this research possible. Big, big, big thanks to them. Also, one of the things that all the different DOTs, yes, every one of these people contributed money to this research project to help make it happen. This work could not have been done without all of you. Big thanks to Vermont DOT, who actually went out and took measurements of concrete before the pump and after the pump. Thank you, thank you, Vermont. Big thanks to Mike and Robert from FHWA who kicked in some extra money to do some of the heated and cooled work that I'm gonna talk about today. Everything that I'm gonna talk about today can be summarized on this slide. Pumping, champagne, and Return of the Jedi. Now, in my presentation, I'm gonna talk about three things. Why do we add air to concrete? Why do pumps change the air content of concrete? And why does the air come back? And if you see my friend here, Pistol Pete, that is the mascot of Oklahoma State University. If you see him on any one of these slides, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, because something important is about to happen. The first thing is, why do we add air to concrete? Well, air and train bubbles are the key to the freestyle resistance of your concrete. And the second bold item is really important. The volume of air does not equal your freestyle performance. You're like, whoa, 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 Tyler. What do you mean? If I get 6% air in my concrete, my specification says that I'm great. And that was exactly right in 1952 when Paul Klieger did the original research. But our concretes have changed immensely since 1952. We have different, different admixtures, different cements, different construction practices. So many different things are different. The most important thing is this bottom bullet item. Smaller bubbles are more effective in providing freestyle resistance and have less of an impact on our concrete than the larger bubbles do. We want small, well-distributed bubbles in our concrete. So if you still don't understand what I'm talking about, I've got two air void systems, one on the left and one on the right. They both have the same volume of air. But if I'm a concrete person, I want the air void system on the right. I want small, well-distributed bubbles in my concrete. You might say, well, what? Why is that? Well, if I'm a water molecule and I am here inside my paste of my concrete and I go to freeze, there's only a certain distance that I can travel before I start to cause damage to my concrete. And those distances are shown by the orange here. What matters is that we are protecting a much more distance or volume on the right than we are on the left. Much, much more protection for the same volume of air by using small, well-distributed bubbles than we are with one or two or a larger number of large bubbles. We don't want large bubbles. We want small, well-distributed bubbles. Now, how do you measure this? Well, one way to measure it is called the spacing factor, where we literally cut the concrete up and count the bubbles inside and calculate something called the spacing factor. I'll be talking about that today. Lower the spacing factor, the better. There's another way to measure it, something called the super air meter. This is great because you can do it in fresh concrete. And if you look at Ashto R101, that's the performance engineered mixture specification developed by the US DOT. It says for the super air meter, we wanna have an air volume greater than 4% and we want to have a SAM number, at least for field acceptance, to be less than 0.30. And that SAM number is gonna tell you about bubble spacing. But, but what, where is it from? What is this all about? 
Well, let's show some data. On the x-axis, I have air content, and on the y-axis, I have durability factor. This is performance in a test called the ASTM C666 test, a freeze-thaw test. And everything above 70 is good, and everything below 70, not so good. And you can see here with this data that if I have high air contents, things are good. If I have low air contents, things are not so good. But what air content should I pick? I mean, to get 70, which air, air content should I pick? Well, and for some of these, 2%, 2.5% may be okay. For some of these, even at 6 and 7% air, I am not okay. And that's because... They have different bubble systems. Stuff with smaller bubble systems don't need much air to pass the free thaw test. Stuff with large bubble systems need a lot more air to pass the free thaw test. And this is just an indicator that we don't, cannot just use our air volume to make a decision about free thaw or free thaw durability. We need more information. Now I'm going to show you the same data. Same durability factor data, but now I'm going to use SAM number. That's the number I showed you before that comes out of the fresh concrete in about 10 minutes for the test. And look at this. SAM number about 0.32 correlates with this line here. Here's the line here at 70%. You can see as the SAM number gets higher and higher and higher, all of a sudden you hit what I call the cliff of doom. That's why it falls off the edge. It doesn't do well. Things start to fail in the freeze thaw test. We don't like it. It's not good. We, no, we don't want above it, above this number. We want to avoid the cliff of doom. And what, what's going on here? The SAM number just does a much better job of telling you about your bubble size distribution. That's why it doesn't have the same spread that air volume does. In summary, higher air content typically means improved freeze thaw durability. Lower SAM number means improved freeze thaw durability. And the SAM number is a better predictor of freeze thaw performance than the air volume. And both air volume and SAM number can be measured in fresh concrete. That's pretty cool and all. So why are we doing all this? Why am I talking about this? Well, concrete pumps are an essential tool in our concrete industry, but it's hard to predict how pumping will impact the air void system inside of our concrete. For example, I'm showing a concrete pump here. I'm showing a ready mix truck showing up. The concrete truck is delivered here. And because engineers are worried about what the concrete pump is going to do to the concrete, they specify and require in the majority of the cases for people to sample it at this location, at the point of placement. I'll tell you what, before I did this research, I would have done the same thing. When I worked in practice, I did the exact same thing. But after doing all this work, I don't think this is the right thing to do anymore at all. Here's what happens. If I have um, Calvin and um, um, Susie here, Calvin is my ready mix producer. Susie is my general contractor. Calvin says, hey, I brought you the concrete with the right air content that you asked for. And Susie says, it doesn't have the right air content anymore. And they fight and they yell and they bicker. And you know what this causes? This causes risk. This causes arguments. This causes problems. And what people have to do is they have to jack the air content up super high so that when it goes into the pump, they hope and pray that when it comes out the other side, that it's within the specification. There's also these one time this worked or that worked. I think this will fix it or I think that will fix it or I didn't have the problem in this case or that case. There's all these wise tales out there about what could happen. Now, if you look at the mechanisms that causes air loss or could cause air loss when you pump, there are three of them. There's pressure, there's vacuum, and there is the impact when it hits the ground. We have studied all three of them at Oklahoma State University, and the one that is most important and the one that we will talk about today is the pressure caused by the pump itself as you pump concrete. So we're going to basically study concrete before pumping and after pumping, and we're going to use all of these methods. Measure the air volume, the SAM number, that gives you the air void spacing in fresh concrete. Spacing factor, yet we're going to let the concrete harden, cut it up and polish it and actually count the bubbles, and then do our freestyle performance, our ASTM C666 test. 
This is the mixture design that we're going to use again and again for the lab testing. And we're going to vary the air contents, the water reducers. We're going to look at 33 different lab mixtures. Now, we are so blessed at Oklahoma State University to have our own concrete pump. Now, this is a concrete li line pump, but it is the same guts that are used in a concrete boom pump. It's just a lot less expensive, and you can study and get at a lot more things this way. Now, we have built ourselves a pipe network. That's where we can make our own concrete, pump it, it moves, it goes, it goes up here. Now, this is showing it going back into the pump. For this testing I'm about to show you, we did not send it back into the pump. We captured it in wheelbarrows where we could test the concrete and see what it looks like. We're going to test it before the pump, and we're going to test it after the pump for all those things that I showed you before. Now, in our pump, we had a four inch diameter steel pipe, 60 foot of that or so. Then we have 10 foot of rubber hose. And then we have looked at pumping pressures from 55 to 110 PSI. And these are lower than what you would see in the field. Now, here is some data. Now, Pistol Pete is here. Wake up, everybody. Pistol Pete, our friend, is here. Air content is shown on our X axis. Durability factor or performance in the free saw test is shown on the y-axis, and I'm showing you a bunch of data points here. Now, the first thing to pay attention to, these little dash data points, these are ones that were from previous work, stuff that was never pumped, and you can see as your air content gets, gets low, your durability factor is not good. This is, these are non-pumped concrete. That makes sense, but now pay attention. Wake up. Everything above here, if it's a solid data point, it is before pumping. It is, if it is an open data point, it is after pumping. After pumping concrete, we have data points with 2%, 1%, 1.5%, 3% error in the fresh concrete. By many, many people's opinions, those concretes should fail the freeze thaw test, and they're not. They are not failing the freeze thaw test, even though we're measuring very, very low air contents inside of that concrete. Now, if I do the same thing with the SAM number, remember that measures the bubble spacing. Again, these dashed lines are things that have never, ever been pumped. And as the SAM number gets higher, then things get bad. They start to fail the freeze thaw test. But look, 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 look. That is the non-pumped concrete. And let's look at the pumped concrete. Again, everything that's a solid dot was before pumping. Everything that's an open dot is after pumping. And look at all these pumped concretes with horrible, horrible SAM numbers, and they pass the freeze thaw test. In summary here, we had 33 mixtures, and if you looked at them in the specification, the Ashto R101 specification, all 30 of the three of them met it, and they were great. But after pumping, only 11 met it. That means 22 out of the 33 mixtures would be rejected, as in thrown away, as in I sampled after the pump, you don't meet this specification, I don't want your concrete. And in practice, in the hardened concrete, all 33 of those that met the specification passed the freeze thaw test. This is a big deal, a massive, massive deal. What it says is that measuring right after the pump seems a little suspect, at least with this lab data. So what we found a clue though, a big clue. If we compared our fresh air content after pumping to our hardened air content after pumping, every single time we saw this growth in air content. We like, what is going on here? So we plotted the data in a different way. Now, this is a little bit strange, but here's before pumping. And this is the ratio of the hardened air content measured divided by the fresh air content. That means we sampled concrete before pumping, we measured it within the fresh, and then we measured it hardened, and we took the ratio, and we multiplied by 100. So if this, on average, was exactly the same, no difference on average, but after pumping, look at this. On average, it was 1.15 times higher. On average, we saw 1.15 times more air in the hardened concrete than we did when we measured the fresh after pumping. That is a massive, important observation. Then we looked at the spacing factor. Remember, that's the bubble spacing I showed you before. But before pumping is here on the x-axis. After pumping is on the y-axis. This would be perfect agreement along this line here. And this is the variation of the test method. Look at that. Everything is within the variation of the test method. That means Statistically speaking, there is no difference between the bubble spacing before pumping and after pumping. 
So in discussion here, satisfactory freestyle performance of pump concrete was observed, even though there were low air contents and high sand numbers after pumping, but there's minimal change in the spacing factor measured in the hardened concrete taken before and after pumping. That is a big deal. And the hardened and fresh measurements closely matched prior to pumping, but after pumping, on average, it was 1.15 times higher in the fresh, in the hardened compared to the fresh. That means after pumping, if I measured 6% air in the fresh concrete, then I would expect to actually have about 7% air in the hardened concrete. And again, we saw that again and again and again. And this is important. The fresh measurements after pumping were not representative of the performance or properties of the hardened concrete. Again, it goes back to this plot I showed you before here, where we have this reliable, unreliable, reliable. These measurements right after pumping were just not reliable. They were not, they did not represent what went on in the hardened concrete. Measuring everything before the pump, before what was going on, was a very great thing, useful thing, and it's a powerful way to predict what's going to be in your hardened concrete. But I know, more data, right? Well, does temperature change any of this? Well, we made concrete mixtures where we either heated all the raw ingredients or we cooled all the raw ingredients until we made these different, different temperatures. We had cold mixes, we had hot mixes, we had room temperature mixes, just to throw in some, some extra ones. And we measured with the same pump, same pipe orientation, same testing before and after the pump, same sampling procedures, everything was the same, and let's look what happened. Now, here is our durability factor, that's our freestyle performance, and here is our fresh air content over here. Now, all of these solid data points were before pumping, and all of these open data points were after pumping, and again, and again, and again, we see mixtures here with 3% error or so after pumping that are passing the freestyle test. This is a game changer, this is a big deal, this is the same thing we saw before. Now, let's move into SAM number over here, again, these are the samples before pumping, right? They had pretty good SAM numbers. And after pumping, we had horrible SAM numbers. As in, we would expect them to all fail and do awful, and they didn't, they did great. Now, there are a few data points down here. You might say, Tyler, what's going on here? We made some on purpose with bad air void systems just to show that when you do, yep, those still don't do very well in the freeze thaw test, and they don't do very well after pumping as well. Here's our spacing factor, measured before pumping and compared to measure after pumping. Here is the line of agreement. And again, there is the variation of the test method and everything is falling within the variation of the test method or within a 95% confidence interval. Again, this shows that things aren't changing that much. So satisfactory freestyle performance of pump concrete was observed even though there were low air contents and high sand numbers after pumping. But there's minimal change in spacing factor measured in the hardened concrete taken before and after pumping. And the fresh measurements, again, are not representative of the performance or the properties of the hardened concrete. Heck, this is the same conclusion that we had before. So that's nice, and that's the lab. So what in the heck is going on in the field? Well, so we went to 30 different projects and examined 62 different concrete mixtures from bridge decks, walls, sidewalks, parking lot, drill shafts, 18 different types of pumps, different boom lengths, different diameters, different boom configurations. What am I talking about? We have flat, we have arch configuration, and then we have the A-frame, the like shoot it straight up and then shoot it straight down to see what, what would happen. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, we made the pump be in a flat configuration, in an arch configuration, and then the up and down roller coaster-like A-frame situation to just see if those were any different. And we measured tons and tons and tons of data. Now here is the fresh air content before the pump. Here is the fresh air content after the pump. And this line here would be perfect agreement. And the dashed line would be the variation of the test method. And we saw a lot of air, air decreases here. Look at that. One in four times we saw a statistically significant air decrease in the concrete that we were testing. Now let's look at SAM number. Here is SAM number before pumping. Here is SAM number after pumping. There is perfect agreement. There is the variation of the test method. And look at that. One out of every three times. 
we saw a statistically significant change in the air void system between um, pumping versus non-pumping. This is the same type of stuff we saw before. So air content changed one out of four times. SAM number changed one out of three times. And you're like, yeah, I know. This happens in the field. I've seen it. I get it. But how does the hardened concrete perform? Let's talk about that next. So let's look at hardened air content before the pump versus hardened air content after the pump. And again, there is perfect agreement and there is the variation of the test method. And one out of four, again, we saw a statistically significant increase in the air content of the concrete. This is the same thing I showed you before. Remember that? Hardened air divided by fresh air multiplied by 100. Before pumping, it was almost exactly the same. After pumping, what do we get in the lab? About 1.15 times higher. What do we get in the field? About 1.15 times higher. Literally no difference between the lab and the field. Now let's look at that spacing factor. Some would argue is the most important measurement here. Here's before pumping on the x-axis. Here's after pumping on the y-axis. That is perfect agreement. That is the variation of the test method and the things are within. The data point is within. This is a statistically significant, um, no difference in change in our spacing factor that we're measuring here. So the hardened and fresh measurements closely matched prior to pumping. After pumping, the hardened air content was on average 1.15 times higher. That means if I went in with 6%, I measured 6% after pumping, I'd expect seven in the hardened concrete. And there is no statistically significant change in the spacing factor when comparing before and after pumping. These are the same findings that we had from the lab, but with all kinds of different pumps, all kinds of different equipment and materials, and the every again and again and again, the fresh measurements after pumping do not seem to represent the performance or properties of the hardened concrete. So what in the world is happening? Well, let's go back to the lab to try to figure that out. The first question we asked was, where does air change within the pump network, as in when I'm pumping, where is our air changing? To do that, we set up our pump in this configuration. We actually got people with air meters at every one of these locations, A, B, C, D, E, and F. We made our own concrete, we dumped it into the pump, we started pumping, and as we were pumping, we said, stop! And that means like, stop the pump, and then we said, go! And what that means is the pump is now stopped, that means take apart the pipe at each one of these locations. Dump your concrete out of the pipe into your air meter and start testing it. And that's exactly what we did. And when we measured that, here's the air content. Here is what it was before pumping. And here it was at point A, B, C, D, E, and F. See the drop in air content? See that? It happens right from the piston when the piston fires to that first little bit of pipe, that's when it happens. That's with that pressure, that's that squish, that's that highest point of pressure along the pipeline. And that's when we see all the air loss. And we see almost no air change after that. So the air was lost right after the pump and stays almost constant throughout the pipe network. And additional piston strokes didn't cause any additional air to be lost. And the air loss coincides with this point of highest pressure. So what's going on? Well, there's something called Henry's Law out there. Henry's Law basically says that if I have a gas above a liquid, as my pressure goes up in the gas, more of that gas is going to dissolve in the liquid. Now, I'm not sure how we got a law for that. I guess they were hanging, handing them out back then for free. I don't know, but that's how Henry got his law, and that's what it says. As the pressure goes up, more gas is going to dissolve. That's a clue to what's going on in that first step there. So this means that the high pressures from the pump, that pump firing in that, in that piston and scrunching that concrete together is causing that air to dissolve. And this happens in the lab and in the field with temperature ranges from 35 to 111 degrees Fahrenheit, at least what I have measured. So, okay, okay, that's cool. How does these pressure change impact the bubble size distribution? So to do that, we had some bubbles that were about or some bottles that are about three inches tall, about two inches wide, about three quarters of an inch or so deep. We're going to fill them up with air and train cement paste. We're going to add water above them, 
put a special lid on them, lower them down, and over time, the bubbles are gonna rise up out of the paste and get caught on the bottom of the glass. We're gonna use a stereo microscope to watch those bubbles and pressurize them and simulate the pumping pressures to see what's going on. Now, here is one of those air void systems, and this is at atmospheric pressure. You can see we got big bubbles. About how many big bubbles we got? About three, right? One, two, three. And how many small bubbles we got? Yeah, about a bazillion, right? A lot, okay? And we're gonna start pressurizing, and let's see what happens. As I increase the first pressure, things change just a little bit. As I increase the pressure again, how many big bubbles do I got? Well, now I have four. One, two, three, four, one is drifted in. Look at those small bubbles. See how they look different? See how they look stressed? We'll talk more about that coming up. Let's go to pressure step number three. How many big bubbles? About three. How many small bubbles? Some. Pressure step four. Now let's keep an eye on these. Pressure step five, what? Bubble disappeared. How many big bubbles we got? About three. There's six, still got three. There's seven, still got three. How many small bubbles do we have? None. What's going on? Well, let's take it back to atmospheric pressure and let's see what happens. Still got our three big bubbles and we had a few small bubbles come back, but not all of them because it used to look like this, a bazillion. Now we're down to about three small ones and about three big ones. What's going on? As, you, as the pressure increases, the small bubbles dissolve into the surrounding solution. And these bubbles do not immediately come back when you decrease the pressure. It takes a little bit of time for them to come back actually. So why do the small bubbles dissolve? Well, there's something called the Laplace-Young equation. And it says that the pressure inside of a bubble is basically a function of the surface tension of the bubble and the diameter. It just means that smaller bubbles are gonna have much, much, much higher pressures in them. I mean, it's gonna be easier for them to dissolve. But there's another big thing with smaller bubbles. They have a much, much higher curvature. That means when you go to push on them, it's much easier to damage them. See us kind of bending this one right here? You're like, bending? Does that really happen? Yeah. Here's a bubble that as we started to increase the pressure, it started to bend and buckle and twist, and then it dissolved after that. So what does this mean? The high pressures during pumping causes the small bubbles to become damaged and ultimately dissolve. And since the small bubbles are dissolved, this means they're not present in the fresh concrete as it leaves the pump. This is why the air volume decreases and the SAM number increases. Let me say that again. When the piston fires, it causes the bubbles to dissolve. They go away. The small bubbles do. And then that's why when we measure them right after the end of the pump, we don't see them anymore. But remember, remember the spacing factor. Remember the spacing factor before the pump and after the pump were the same again and again and again. This means the air comes back with about the same spacing before the concrete hardens. Mind blown, right? Craziness. So how does air change after time, over time after pumping? This was our last experiments we ended up doing. What we did is we went back to our lab and we pumped concrete. We measured concrete before pumping. We measured it right after pumping and we filled up four different containers immediately, right after pumping. We measured one of them right after pumping. Measured another one 15 minutes, another one 30 minutes and 45 minutes. That means they were all pumped at the same time, but they were sampled at different times. One of them immediately after, one of them after 15, after 30, and after 45. And then we got data that looked like this. Here is air volume, and here is time. Now that line there, everything to the left is before pumping, and everything to the right is after pumping. And you can see before pumping to compared to after we lost air. And look at this, here's the non-pumped concrete. We did lose some air in that non-pumped concrete, but we lost air. And then what's going on over here? Well, on the left, bubbles are definitely going away. On the right, are bubbles coming back? kind of looks like some of those bubbles might be coming back over time, but it's kind of hard to tell. Now let's do the same data with a SAM number. Here is SAM number on the y-axis, and here is time after pumping on the x-axis. And every single time, again, there is our line. Before that line to the left, that's before pumping, and, and there is our very first pumped concrete we sampled, and everything to the right after this is stuff that's been pumped, but then sampled over time. And we can see here's our non-pumped concrete there, and look at this, we see a rebound. 
See this rebound where the SAM number goes up and then the SAM number goes down. Before pumping, as we pump the concrete, our bubble spacing is increasing, but it appears like our bubble spacing is decreasing over time. And that is the bubbles returning to the fresh concrete. So how does temperature impact this? Well, hotter mixes means that the air comes back faster. Colder mixes means the air comes back slower, but it still comes back. And the temperature is not a big deal because the bubbles always come back. So what is happening? The pressure from pumping causes the small bubbles to temporarily dissolve. But good performance in petrographic analysis, that's a spacing factor. Freeze-thaw testing, ASTM C666, and reduced SAM number over time. Three very independent measurements show that the dissolved air comes back before the concrete hardens. And when the air does come back, it seems to be well dispersed and provides a similar spacing factor as to what went into the pump. And this is where the champagne comes in, ladies and gentlemen. So because before I open up my bottle of champagne, do I see any bubbles? No. But as soon as I pop, why, do I, why does it pop? Because it's releasing the pressure bubbles start to appear, right? You see the bubbles in the glass. You're not champagne people? All right, Sprite. When the Sprite bottle is closed, do you see any bubbles? No, you don't. But as soon as you pop the cap, you hear the the bubbles. What are you doing? The is releasing the pressure and the bubbles are returning. The same thing is happening in our concrete pump. When we pump it, it's like putting it in the bottle. We, we pressurize it. And then as soon as it comes out of the pump, it's like opening the bottle and allowing the bubbles to come back. But they don't come back instantly. It takes about 45 minutes or so in, in um, um, normal temperature concrete, um, room temperature concrete before they actually come back. And that is why we have Return of the Jedi, ladies and gentlemen. Because this is not Return of the Jedi. This is the return of the bubbles. They come back. Yes. So what does this mean? Because of the high pressures during pumping, the air content and SAM number immediately after pumping are not representative of the hardened concrete. And if this is true, then concrete should not be rejected for low air or high SAM number after pumping. And it appears that sampling the concrete prior to pumping is a good indicator to the air void system in our hardened concrete. And what do I think needs to happen? I think point, testing air at the point of discharge from the pump is dangerous. And it's not representative of the properties of the hardened concrete. And we need, I think, to test the concrete before the pump and not require testing at the point of placement. So, for example, here is our truck showing up. Here is our pump. Their concrete is delivered there. I'm telling you, concrete should be sampled here and not at the point of placement. There's other things I think need to happen. I think we need to use a super air meter. And I think we need to evaluate these mixtures in the mix design to approve them and then regularly verify them in the field to make sure we're getting a good air void system in our concrete. And I think pumping specifications need to change to only require sampling before the pump. But what are other states doing? You're like, great, Tyler, that's your idea. What are other people doing? Well, at this conference, we got to talk to them and ask them and see what's going on. And in one of the polls, this is what they showed. Everyone in green in this image is someone that says that they have their specifications or soon plan to have their specifications where they only sample before the pump. Yeah, you're like, that's a lot of green. Yeah, 26% of the states. This is a movement. This is not just some crackpot idea. People are doing this and have been doing this for years, and they're not seeing poor performance in their concrete. So what do you think? This is where you get to give me your comments. Do you feel like we need to change the sampling location during, during pumping? Do you? Why do you feel this way? What, what's, what's your reasoning? And what do you need to make this change? What do you need to make this change in your practice? And what can you do today? Can you share this video with somebody? Can you talk to somebody? Change is what I'm talking about. And change isn't easy for anybody. I get it, I don't like change. I'm sure you don't either. And we're talking about something that's been around for more than 30 years. We're talking about changing it. 
And so we need to think though, we're going to have some fear around this, but what's true is what am I, is the data I'm showing true? I believe it to be right. And let's have discussions and let's look at these problems through each other's eyes and think about them, put ourselves in each other's positions and have kindness as we talk to one another, as we go through change together and share this video and send me comments and keep moving ahead and keep doing the best we can. If you want more information, I've got a bunch of publications on this at tylerlay.com forward slash pumping. If you want to learn the super air meter, use the super air meter. It was instrumental in my research that I told you about today. You can find about more about it at this website, superairmeter.com. So in conclusion, Pumping was observed to modify the air content and SAM number in both the lab and the field testing. And based on the hardened air void analysis, freeze thaw testing, change in SAM number over time, the small bubbles seem to return to the concrete with a similar air void distribution and freeze thaw performance as was in the concrete prior to pumping. And the SAM was an invaluable tool to give insights to performance of what was actually going on. So I hope you dug this video. If you did, please like, subscribe, leave me a comment. And you know what? I love you guys out there. I hope you love concrete as much as I do. Take care, everybody. Peace.